Before we get started, I'd like to make uh, some housekeeping announcements. So these lectures are being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel uh, for later viewing. The archived lectures are accessible on our website, uh, innovate.ca. Each session consists of a 45 or a 50 minute talk, which is followed by uh, a 10 minute Q&A session. Please use the Q&A chat option in Zoom to post any questions you might have for the speaker and please don't use the general chat. You can register for upcoming lectures on our website, again at innovate.ca. Our next lecture will be taking place on Thursday, May 13th, where we, where we will be talking uh, about regulatory compliance uh, for uh, uh, software and AI technologies. Uh, again, a reminder, as soon as our session ends, you will be prompt to answer a short survey. Uh, so we kindly ask you to take the time to provide us with your feedback so we can uh, improve these events uh, in the future. Finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the generous support from the Government of Canada for funding the Innovate Network uh, through the Strategic Innovation Fund program. So uh, shifting gears to today, our guest speaker, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Leonard, has earned his a PhD in physics from University of Toronto and has uh, worked at several uh, startup companies in telecommunications, software, and medical diagnostics. Uh, he has worked in, in numerous roles, uh, including scientific research, product development, business development strategy, and, and intellectual property management. He's, uh, Steve is a registered US and a Canadian patent agent and is currently an associate at Hill & Schumacher, a boutique IP firm in Toronto. Uh, his practice includes drafting and prosecuting patent applications and advising uh, technology startups, teaching hospitals and universities on a patent strategy. Steve is also an entrepreneur and a co-founder at uh, Cuvella Diagnostics, uh, a medical diagnostic startup that is developing a rapid molecular test for diagnosing sepsis. Uh, Steve's role at uh, Cuvella uh, focuses on corporate strategy and intellectual property management. So without further ado, it's my pleasure and to turn this over to Steve. Steve. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmed. I am going to share my screen now. Hopefully yep. this works. Okay, are we good? Yep. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, thanks so much, Ahmed. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to everyone, to everyone today as part of the Innovate uh, series. Um, I think it's great that um, Sunnybrook and the partners uh, through the Innovate program are engaging in AI-based um, innovation and supporting new AI technologies in the IGT space. Um, when, so, and I've been patenting in this space, filing patent applications for a few years now and encountering AI through my work at Cuvella, we were, we're using AI um, in, in deep learning and machine learning technologies there for both image analysis, we're doing microbiology work, and also in terms of genomic uh, signature detection for trying to find biomarkers. So we're using it. I know a lot of Canadian entrepreneurs and researchers are using it. The question is, are we protecting the IP properly and, and how do we best do that? And for those of you who are relatively new to, to patenting, um, this is a challenging area. This is a highly nuanced and probably the most one of the most uh, tricky areas to do patenting in just because of the technical um, complexity and the challenges in just how deep some of the technology goes into the algorithmic layer and the decision making in terms of whether or not to patent and what to patent can be quite complex. So. Um, what I wanted to do with this talk is to <clears throat> share some thoughts and sort of do some thinking and some analysis on the space. So you'll see the agenda that I put together is, where are we going here? Okay, great. So I wanted to start off with 
a survey or um, an analysis of what kind of AI patent work is happening right now in, in the IGT space to give you a flavor of what's happening ex externally and in particular in the, in the commercial uh, sectors. Um, because that's insightful. I think that's really helpful to see. Um, then I wanted to take a step back and think about the different forms of IP in, in IGT and in, in IGT innovations. It seems like a simple thing, but I wanted to sort of peel back the onion a little bit and think that through. Then I, a key takeaway that I want to leave you all with is just this difficult decision between whether or not to patent or to just keep the inventions as a trade secret. And I'm going to give you some guidance and some, some, some thoughts, at least, on, on how to try to address that issue. And then um, some strategies for AI patenting, should you go and, and, and try to seek a patent on, on AI technologies. Great. OK, so first of all, some trends in AI patenting in the IGT space. So start off just talking about what AI is. And this is a great slide from the WIPO um, technology trends, uh, and there was there was a, a great um, publication a couple of years ago, ago that summarized AI. It was more generic. It wasn't just in the imaging space. It was in anything, um, in any technology field. But um, it just shows that AI can mean so many different things to different people. And I think now when we're talking about AI, we're thinking more about the machine learning space and deep learning and all this stuff down here in the bottom right quadrant. Um, AI patenting just in general has been on the rise very recently. You can see um, that from a scientific perspective in terms of the literature, AI has been you know, increasing significantly since the mid nineties when sort of more rule-based AI was, was the norm. And then in the early 2000s to the past decade, there was this huge inflection point and deep learning and the promise of deep learning took off. And you see this huge increase in both scientific publications and more importantly in patent families. So that is a, a sort of a generic data point there on AI patenting in general, but I wanted to go and look a little bit more closely and think about what some of the key players in the medical imaging and other related spaces are doing and, and try to assess AI patent activity and the level of activity in the, in the IGT space. It was a little tricky to do this because IGT itself, I think is a, an interest, intersectional field really. It's kind of the union of a number of different fields, including um, these, these core aspects, which I think include image processing, image acquisition, and, and some kind of intervention. Not necessarily all three, but I think IG, IGT at its best includes all three. <clears throat> and the actual term AGT, or IGT, I should say, is it's, it's not used by everyone. I know, I know a lot, some people use it, some don't. Philips uses it quite a bit in some of their marketing. Um, but it's really a blend of a number of different subfields that are related, I think, which include medical imaging, surgical navigation. Um, you could argue that digital pathology and robotic surgery are even subdomains are related. So what I tried to do was to look, look at these subfields and look at the patent activity related to AI in these to try to quantify. So I did a patent search and I looked at IGT related fields. I limited the hits to US and PCT filings. So these are um, hits that, that either had a publication in the US or, or a PCT. I sorted by year. I looked at some of the key players in each field and I focused on deep learning and I used convolutional neural networks as a proxy, as a search term to pull out um, deep learning base related uh, patent applications. And I look for published ap applications as opposed to um, patent filings because of the blackout period in patents. So if you file a patent application, it's a year and a half before it publishes. So if I had been looking for applications, I would have seen fewer last year because they just haven't published yet and I can't see them. So by looking for published applications, I could see things clearly. So without further ado, here is the results for the medical imaging space. 
And the key players I looked at here were Siemens, Philips, GE's. They're, they're arguably some of the big ones. I also added Canon. There's others I could have added as well, but I didn't want to make the, the graph too messy. The idea was just to show some trends here in terms of what's happening. And you see something similar to what we saw in the general AI graph where things started to really take off at 2016, maybe a little bit delayed, maybe a year later in this, in this field. Um, but what you see is that Siemens has really been a leader here and starting early with patent applications. These are patent applications that refer to convolutional neural networks. And um, you know, a good fraction, I would say even a quarter of these patent applications or maybe a third even had you know, these kinds of terms in the claims. So these are relevant. Um, interestingly, Philips is a little bit behind, but then it's caught up. So you can see in this past year, last year, both Philips and Siemens had over 100 patent filings each that were related to um, deep learning, which is really interesting. And uh, just to be sure that I wasn't picking up sort of peripheral Siemens and Philips patents, I actually put the search criteria here that it had, the patent application had to refer to um, MR or CT or ultrasound, just to sort of pick up some dominant imaging modalities. So we're looking at a subset of all, all these, all the uh, patent applications of Siemens and the other players here. Interestingly, GE has, has, has just started, has kind of like been sleepy here and has woken up and said, oh, wait a second, I got to get in there too. So it's really interesting to see that, but lots and lots of patent filing. So because these only represent a subset of all the players, doesn't even include all of the academics. And there are a lot of academic filings, especially some of the um, institutional uh, settings, uh, research settings in China. There's quite a few patents coming out of, out of China. And even some you know, non-traditional imaging companies like Google and like uh, Baidu that are AI um, sort of IT companies that are starting to think about medical imaging as well. So it's really interesting to see this. Um, in surgical navigation, I looked at Stryker, Medtronic, Brain Lab, and Hollow Surgical, which is sort of a newer player. And interestingly, if you just look at the scale here, the, the, it maxes out at 16, so far, far fewer patent applications. And things don't start to take off till 2018 or in 2019. So surgical navigation, arguably um, a bit of a laggard in much fewer filings. Um, I also looked at um, other niches in uh, medical AI. I looked at Page AI and Path AI and Procia, which are some big digital pathology companies that are trying to digitize um, the workflow for tissue slide prep. And of those guys, there were only about 10 deep learning related patents total. And there's only, they're only published over the past couple of years. Now these are relatively newer players, so I'm guessing that we're gonna see more from them over the coming years, but this could also be an indication that they are leaning towards trade secrecy as opposed to um, patent protection for a lot of their IP. Um, similarly, in the robotic surgery space, um, I looked at Intuitive, um, Oris, and Simmer, and similar findings to digital pathology, only a handful of patent applications and only recent publications. So the conclusion here <clears throat> is that you know, the traditional imaging, um, where you would expect um, leadership and sort of earlier AI in terms of deep learning, it is definitely leading. And Siemens is, is clearly leading the pack here. Um, and in surgical navigation, we've got a bit of a delay and about 10 times less volume of, of patent applications. In, in digital pathology and robotic surgery, very low activity right now. So the conclusion that you know, one can come to based on this very limited research, so you would probably wanna test this with further research, but you do see a very strong med tech, so a very strong commercial um, thrust in terms of AI patent activity. Um, it's not just academic, it's not just in the academic literature. We are seeing you know, thousands of patent filings here now that are related to imaging or related to some kind of navigation or, or robotic surgery um, that are that are out there by by the the, the leaders, uh, the commercial leaders and the strategics. Um, 
in the medical imaging space, it's more than five years since this has been happening. I think it's probably going to plateau to in the, in the coming years. So we'll probably see in the low hundreds of filings per year from the big strategics. In the other spaces, I think it's on the rise, and I think we're going to see this continue. And you know, IGT being arguably being an intersection of these and, and leaning more towards the therapeutic side. I think there's that space is still very much on the rise. And I think there are some good opportunities in the coming years for um, IP, AI. And I think you guys are in the right place at the right time with, uh, with the program. So I wanted to take a step back also and ask, so you know, what is the IP in, in IGT? Uh, in, sorry, in IGT Innovations. And I just wanted to get you thinking that thinking about all of the different levels of IP that are that are there. I know we typically think in in AI and deep learning of a new algorithm, but it's so much more than that. Um, first and foremost, it's the data. The data is a core core piece of IP, and it can be really critical to um, secure access to that data and um, secure the rights to that data, protect your proprietary access to that data. You see a lot of companies now um, going to multiple networks in the US, for example, like large um, KOL type centers to get good data and to secure the rights to it. Sometimes first negotiating academic rights and then maybe an option to acquire commercial rights or maybe even going straight for commercial rights. Um, you may have heard about page AI which I think came out of Memorial Sloan, um, getting a license, an eight-year uh, license to commercial license to the 25 million uh, cancer pathology slides that they have there. And I know that definitely ruffled a lot of feathers, but it's just showing what people are doing and how critical getting that data is. And finding partners who have the right data and the right labels, labeled data or the ability to prepare the data in a proper way. It's just such a critical piece of the of the IP. Um, of course, there's new model architectures, which are, you know, traditionally where people have gone and some of the early, earlier uh, um, AI inventions and innovations have been that and have been in that category. But there's also a lot of other areas where that are fruitful for new IP, such as new ways of training or, or validation and testing, um, application specific adaptations of a known model. So you've got some known model, you're going to, it's been applied generically. You've got some clinical case where um, you need to adapt it in some way. And, and that adapt adaptation is arguably inventive, not obvious, and you can potentially patent that. Um, methods for pre-processing data, how to get the data right before it goes into your um, algorithm. Um, and this next one, which I find interesting, it's selecting and preparing specific data sets to address specific clinical questions. That's a mouthful, I didn't, I, I didn't really phrase that well. But what I'm trying to get at here is it's a non-trivial process to figure out what the right clinical question to ask is, and then how to go and figure out which data set you need, which demographic, which conditions of the subpopulation are important, what modalities of signal are important, um, you know, and how to generate features from that. That, that is a, a non-trivial process. And there is definitely some innovation going on there, whether or not you patent that, or that's a form of your trade secrecy, how you obtain that, or what the specific data structure is. That is definitely IP in my opinion. Um, adaptations to clinical workflows based on AI. So some new ways of, of, of um, changing, uh, improving workflow using some kind, of new, some kind of AI tools and then visualization methods in terms of being able to visualize data better. So these are all different types of, of, of IP and different types of inventions. Um, in the in the AI space, and when I think about, you know, the flip side of like looking at it from a sort of opportunistic clinical perspective, um, I think about 
some these are just some things that come to mind and, and you guys are the experts so i'm sure you have a, a whole your, your whole list but these are just some that i thought of that just kind of show the the opportunities that, that are there beyond just finding a better algorithm for classification or something like that so clearly in the igt space we're looking at interoperative being important so interoperative visualization better anatomical segmentation um, <clears throat> augmentation, image annotation, um, new tools for patient stratification. So looking at patient population, the, finding the right pop patient population that is, is, a, uh, is, is gonna work for a certain intervention using AI, um, prediction tools such as being able to predict risk and predict outcomes for um, a given patient, uh, having a, a, a selected procedure based on historical data. Um, I think that one's really interesting in terms of the risk and the outcome prediction question, because a lot of us approach um, this field from the clinical perspective, you know, thinking about what's going to be best for the patient and how you can best improve outcomes for the patient. But commercial success um, is always predicated by having a good health economic story and a good um, reimbursement story and thinking about whose, mon whose pocket you are putting money in. And I think in this case, it's just really interesting to, to delve into that a little bit and think about um, who's willing to pay for that and who that might actually not be good for and just um, think strategically if you're going to be developing products that are, that are risk-based in terms of getting out there and having those conversations with, with payers and with stakeholders early. Um, interoperative registration, fusion of data using multiple modalities, that just kind of sounded fun. Um, interoperative decision support, I think is a key one. So being able to equip clinicians with new forms of feedback um, interoperatively that are provided in the best way possible so that they can make the best decisions possible. And then improve data management. So being able to you know, handle the large volumes of data they, that are being generated. And, and I'm just thinking maybe there's some good AI tools that, that can help with that in the future. OK, so that was just some thoughts about IGT and types of inventions just to sort of get the juices flowing. Now, the key takeaway that I have that I want you to remember is you don't necessarily need to patent an, uh, something that is that, that's new and and uh, proprietary and and and, and of value. A, a good um, path is also uh, considering trade secrecy. And yes, I'm a patent agent, and yes, I make my money by filing patent applications. But I'm also an entrepreneur, and I care about getting it right and making sure that the the best um, choice is made for protecting um, any innovation. So I'm gonna try to help you think through, sort of give you some tools here to think through this decision-making in terms of um, whether or not to patent whether or whether or not to maintain it as a trade secret. And um, hopefully that'll, that'll help when you're in that situation. <clears throat> so a lot of people talk about the pros of patenting and all the great things that patents give, but I wanted to flip it and look instead at the pros and cons of trade secrecy, because I think that's a better angle for, for assessing this issue. So there are many pros of trade secret protection, and it's worth really, really thinking about. Um, trade secrets are very low cost. It doesn't really cost anything to get trade secrecy protection other than the controls that you need to have to maintain secrecy, which we'll talk about after. The protection is immediate. There's no filing of an application. There's no waiting you know, two years plus for a, an examiner to come back and opine on whether or not you're gonna get your protection. It's there, it's immediate. There's no expiry. So patents have a 20 year term. Trade secrets don't, they don't expire. Um, there's no requirements for public disclosure. So the quid, quo, quid pro quo of patenting is that I, as a government, will grant you exclusionary rights, provided that you tell the world what you did. Um, 
so that uh, you're going to spur innovation and you know donate to the public after the patent term ends. That's not the case for trade secrecy, and that's actually an argument against you know strong trade secrets protection because it does um, potentially shelter in, uh, innovations from the world. But it's definitely something something to think about as a, as a pro. Um, there's no subject matter eligibility requirement. And if, if time permits, we'll talk a little bit in more detail about that. But in the case of patenting, there's a, an examiner sort of gatekeeping the, the, the doors of the patent office and won't examine every patent. The examiner will reject some patents even before you know, what you think of examination in terms of you know, prior art and novelty and obviousness. Before that starts, they'll assess subject matter eligibility and sometimes say, no, no, your invention is too abstract or it's a law of nature or something like that. Um, that's not the case for, for uh, trade secrets, um, just because of the broad scope of protection that trade secrets are. And you know, also just thinking about trade secrets, they go so, so far beyond just inventions. It can be everything from you know, a new discovery to the list of, um, to the data itself that you have, to <clears throat> the model parameters in your data, which you're going to protect, and your and your algorithm, I should say, which which are probably very hard to figure out, to the list of institutions that you're thinking of partnering with. Those are all trade secrets. Um, another thing is that trade secrets do capture innovations and improvements that happen beyond the initial invention. So let's say you're You've got an initial new idea, AI-based model, but you're continuing to tweak it and it's evolving. Patents kind of freeze that. You have to sort of pick at some point what you're going to protect. And then if, if there's further innovation, you have to, and you want to protect that by patents, you have to file follow-on patent applications. And that can get super expensive, especially if you're filing in multiple countries, whereas trade secrets, uh, there isn't any requirement to, to refile file at all. Um, and the scope of protection, interestingly, in trade secrets includes negative trade secrets. So those are actually all the things that went wrong. And that can be a very valuable form of IP, because when you think about it, um, that's what's guiding you, all the mistakes, right? So if you were to start over, you would probably have to make all those same mistakes again um, to get to where you are. So it's just interesting to think that that actually counts as a potential trade secret. So there are lots of cons of trade secrecy as well. Um, the, the, these you know, top ones are pretty obvious to everyone that you can't stop a competitor who independently develops the technology. Trade secrets don't do that. They protect the theft of the, of the, um, of the idea from, from, the, uh, from the owner. Um, and of course, a competitor could obtain a patent, uh, independently developed invention. Um, they could they could patent that invention and sue for sue you for infringement if they can determine that you have infringed. So if they can actually discover the, the infringement, <clears throat> there's the risk of a competitor reverse engineering your technology. For example, even if you have an AI tool with some of the key stuff buried inside the arguably the black box. Um, if the would-be infringer has access to that black box and can feed it inputs and look at the outputs, there's potential that some of the inner workings could be inferred. Similarly, just by virtue of playing, looking at the, the UI potentially and what some of the inputs are, um, you know, that's a possibility. So that's something to think about. Um, and trade secrets require constant diligence to maintain confidentiality. You have to show that you're actually, you know, taking uh, these steps to maintain confidentiality to, to be able to assert a trade secret, trade secret theft. Um, the confidentiality may um, conflict with business objectives. So let's say you've elected trade secrecy, but you also want to go out there and talk about your technology. Obviously, that can be con a conflicting situation. It can be difficult to know what level at which to talk about your technology before you start to erode your trade secret rights. 
um, the there are costs and systems, the costs of the systems for um, for maintaining secrecy in terms of you know the infrastructure you have to have and the confidentiality that you need to to, to maintain. And one tricky thing is the inability to discuss with potential investors. So if you're getting out there talking to new investors or strategic partners who won't sign an NDA, then you know you can't really talk about your trade secret. And even if you have a, a would be an investor or strategic who has signed an NDA, it can sometimes be hard having them understand the the value in the in the trade secret. Um, you know, compared to the value of a, of a issue patent, for example. So there, that's um, lots of uh, things to think about, and um, hopefully that that uh, has has opened your eyes a little bit more to some of the the value of, of trade secrecy. So here are some questions <clears throat> that I think are useful for you to ask yourself when trying to evaluate a AI invention in terms of whether or not to go for patenting or whether or not to go for tr trade secrecy. So one question is, if, um, you're, if, if someone was infringing, would you be able to detect that? So if, if, uh, if a competitor was out there in infringing, you know, what tools would you have to be able to detect that infringement? Um, would a competitor be able to reverse engineer your product? So, you know, what abilities would they have to take your product and, and, and take it apart or do some of this black box testing? Um, what design around options are available? So have you invented a true barrier in terms of, you know, being, being able to stop others from achieving a certain result? Or is it really just one of many different ways and if people work, they'll be able to come up with some other model um, or some other solution. Um, would the invention likely satisfy the patentable subject matter eligibility requirements? So is it too abstract to get a patent and what are the risks of that? Um, that's an issue because if you file a patent application and it goes all the way to examination and you don't end up getting the claims that you want, well, you've made that disclosure, the patent publishes, and that can be really bad. <laughs> um, what is the scope of protection that is likely obtainable? So again, if you know the prior art well, you can sort of at least have, a, have an initial assessment in terms of um, you know, knowing what you know, what, what you think the likelihood is that you're gonna get solid, good claims of a strong and, and valuable claim scope. And what's the likelihood of independent development by competitors? This is something that's kind of known and people it, it was it came to you based on reading some papers that others are reading and it's likely they're going to co-develop that's a question to consider um some more here so this is more uh questions to ask yourself you know, in, in this question of trade secrecy versus patenting will ongoing technical refinements be likely um and is it going to be hard to capture those in, in, in a cost-effective way What's the expected life cycle of the technology? Will it be so short that it doesn't make sense to get a patent? Or will it potentially be so long that, you know, and maybe will the time to get clinical acceptance and um, large, market, large market acceptance and large market use and therefore profits, will, will that go into sort of the 10, 15 plus years, which can definitely happen? And therefore, the actual patent term that's, that's, that's valuable, the that's residual patent term of only a few years can be a problem. So would it be better to elect a trade secret in that case? Um, another question, is disclosure going to be needed for the purposes of publications? Are you working with a grad student who is at a university who has a, um, a right and an obligation to publish the thesis. And it, it maybe there's a thesis related to, to the work. Um, is it common in the, in, your, in the field you're working in for companies to have white papers that tech, talk about their technology? Is it gonna be necessary to disclose some aspects of your solution and a regulatory submission that's gonna be publicly available? So these are all valid and important questions. Um, 
will I need to explain the tech to potential investors to obtain funding? And, and you know, is it likely that I'm going to be able to do that in a confidential uh, manner? And you know, this is true for AI. There's a lot of employee turnover. So is it likely that I'm going to have a lot of employee turnover and therefore is it risky that you know, some of my secrets are going to get out there and it's going to be hard for me to even detect that, uh, that trade secret misappropriation? So that is a lot to think about. But I think if you think through these questions and have some discussions internally yourselves or with your patent counsel, with tech transfer, I think this is, is, is a good framework to, to make that assessment. And, you know, really consider the, the potential for, for trade secrecy. You know, in some cases, it'll be a blend. There will be some trade secrecy for some aspects of, of the invention, the data itself, like I was saying, the model parameters. Um, maybe you could get a patent on some application specific aspects that are more or less engineerable and have a blend of trade secrets and patents. So it's not, it's not necessarily an exclusionary thing, but um, definitely worth considering. Okay, so the final stretch here, I think we've got <clears throat> another eight minutes or so before we're gonna open up to some questions. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about some strategies for AI patenting, should you go and decide that you're gonna get a, a patent as opposed to a trade, trade secret. So first suggestion is consider trade secrets <laughs> just to make sure you've done that step. Um, assess, assess patentability through prior art searching. So, you know, this, this comes from the earlier part of the talk where we saw just how much activity there was and how much of a prior art basis being formed um, just over the past few years and uh, how important it will be to, to assess patentability through good prior art searching. Um, <clears throat> carefully draft patent applications to meet subject matter eligibility requirements. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, and this one is true for any patent. Think about value creation and put effort into protecting aspects with high potential commercial value. So we, especially in a very you know, complex, high-tech AI, you know, um, sort of deep technical type inventions, it can, it can get easy to get, it can be easy to get lost in the technical details and to want to protect the technology without stepping back and thinking about what what the true barriers are and where the true value is. I think it's it's hard to do that, but it's worth really trying to do that well. Um, this next one, find a patent agent who has relevant technical background um, and curiosity about the invention. If you've got someone who's uh, you know able to dig in uh, technically and has a genuine interest in, 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 in working on it, I think that's those are the uh, sort of the conditions that I think lead to, lead to good patents. Um, and <clears throat> secure and protect the rights to the underlying data. So we talked about that before, but that's just a, a key important thing to do. So subject matter eligibility, um, I'll just talk briefly about this. The requirements for patentability for an invention are, it has to be new, which is usually the case, but not always. Useful, almost always the case. Inventive, that's a gray area that we argue about a lot with patent examiners when faced with prior art. And subject matter eligible, which is that it has to be within these categories that the patent office deems as being um, you know, worthy of a patent. And areas that are excluded, like I was saying before, are um, <clears throat> sort of highly algorithmic, mathematical, like mathematical formula. Um, uh, laws of nature, um, things of, of business ideas that are that are merely implemented on a computer. So um, this was a real problem a few years ago, 2014, when the Alice Supreme Court case came out, and it was a real problem for for software patents. And since then, th there was a test that, that examiners would would uh, would use to to exclude. Since then, things have got a lot better. Um, the allowance rate for the USPTO has gone up significantly. It's a, well above 60% now, actually. And this came through Andre uh, Ayanku, the previous director of the USPTO. He brought a real change of pace to the USPTO and published examiner, uh, helped to draft examiner guidance 
Um, there are a number of different examiner guidance documents. Uh, I think the latest one was 2000, 2019. And they provide a lot of detail for examiners in terms of how to assess subject matter eligibility in a more concrete way. And it gives guidance for how to actually get around it um, and, and make sure that you are subject matter eligible in your claims. And at the end of the day, it really focuses on making sure that your, your patent claims um, in, your, in, the, in the description and the figures of the patent uh, have, have a lot of technical detail in them and they focus on technical improvements. If you can actually talk about the improvement of the functioning of the computer based on a better algorithm, which is definitely the case in a lot of AI patents, or if you can, if you can um, clearly um, identify uh, the invention being a practical application of an algorithm as opposed, as opposed to sort of wanting to broadly claim the algorithm for anything you've got a better chance. And this is actually a claim. I won't go through the claim here, but it's you can just kind of look at it and clearly see that it's a AI claim. It's got transformations. It's got you know training data sets here, neural networks. This was a claim that was deemed as being patent eligible in the guidance. So that is, that is good news. And we fear the subject matter eligibility test much less now than we used to. Um, similar thing happened in Canada uh, last year, but not as clear as in the US, unfortunately. So, you know, some of the tips are for su surviving this, the subject matter eligibility test are to focus on a technical solution to a technical problem, to describe performance improvements that result from the invention, to describe the invention as being a practical application of AI to solve problem in a particular field. So this is where you know related to finding a, a new inventive application for a known algorithm where you had to tweak the algorithm a little bit, maybe tweak how it was trained or tweak the structure of the algorithm or the, the model or put a couple together. That's all fair game. Um, and yeah, exactly. Describe application specific technical features. Um, and then provide enough technical detail that demonstrates that it would be too hard to make this work in the human mind, because that can be a rejection sometimes saying that it could be done on pen and paper. And a, um, a potentially viable uh, way around this is to say, no, it's just too complicated. It would take too long to do it by hand. So um, I think we're just about done here. Um, this is just the final slide with some key takeaways for you. AI patenting is, is in full swing in, in IGT fields and related fields. That's exciting and the timing is, is right for, for all of you. Um, there's lots of further opportunities, I think, um, in the coming decade for, for, for work, especially in the interventional side. Um, it can very, it, it's important to carefully consider trade secret protection and um, if you elect that, to make sure that you're taking steps to protect the confidentiality of the trade, trade secrets that, that you, uh, you know, choose to protect in that path. Um, prioritize and, and you're getting access to data and protect that access to data and find those, uh, seek those agreements that are going to give you the, the appropriate rights and, you know, and eventually the commercial rights. And um, carefully draft a patent applications that focus on value creation and subject matter eligibility. And with that, it's 546. I will stop and we'll, we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Steve, for a very informative talk and uh, for providing very interesting perspectives on the AI and patent activity in the IGT space, uh, as well as discussing different IP uh, assets and strategies that are typically used in the sector. So, um, yeah, we do have uh, questions, but I'll, I'll start with a question I, I have. So one of the, I think, ongoing debates uh, in the uh, IP sector is uh, the ambiguity uh, some AI inventions have in, in terms of uh, their inventorship and patentability. So in many cases, I think AI is, you know, is a technology that either helps the inventor create the product or form 
part of the product. So in this sense, AI inventions are not necessarily different from other inventions assisted by computers, for example, like the CRM software. So how do you decide or determine whether the AI component of the technology creates inventorship? And how do you know if it meets the criteria for patentability? So as you mentioned, novelty, non-obviousness, and, and usefulness. Yeah, that's, that's a complicated question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think about that a lot. Um, I mean, I think the, the analogy you make to CRM software, or just software in general, is, is a valid one. Um, Sometimes, like if you if you found a new architecture, it's like it's it's equivalent to someone finding a new chip architecture or something like that. There's clear inventive subject matter there, and um, <clears throat> it's possible to claim a method involving the use of that architecture to to process data to get a result. So I, I think I think that can be done aside from you know prior art concerns. Um, I think it gets more interesting when you're talking about applying known models <clears throat> and who the inventors are in that case. Like if you subcontract some AI development to um, you know, AI researchers who are gonna be using known methods to generate new results for you, for example, or, or if you're doing that yourself, you know, what is the invention there? Was it it's clearly not the use of the algorithm because that's known. So maybe it's maybe it's it's finding the appropriate data set and you know having the appropriate conditions of the this is what I was saying before the conditions of the uh, of the um, <clears throat> um, like the, the the patient population or the, or the conditions in which the data was acquired so that when you ran it through um, the model, you're able to get out answers that are uh, like uh, new, new predictive results that are, that, are, that are model primers ultimately that are going to work. So I, th I think it's a, I think it's an open question and I, I have I have I haven't thought about that too much, but I think it's it's an interesting question in terms of inventorship because you, you need to figure out inventorship. And in, especially in, I think it's important for the, the innovate uh, case where you potentially have multiple parties involved. Some are going to be running the AI, some are going to be um, contributing more on the, um, on the side of figuring out how to get the right inputs to the AI. You know, and who, who are the true inventors in that case? It's, it's debatable, right? So um, I think it's a bit of a, a, a gray area, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the patentability, I think that's easier to assess. I think the, the key to doing assessing patentability is asking first being able to um, formulate the appropriate question in terms of what the invention is. If you haven't defined what the invention is, or, or you know, um, like when I go to do a patent search, the very first thing I do is I try to write down in one paragraph what the invention is so that I know what question I'm trying to answer. Um, that's the tricky part in an, AI, in an AI invention because you have to go and first say, um, you know, is it, I, I, I just think it's really important to do that to, to figure out if it's the new model or new model architecture, if it's, um, a, a new way of, of training, or if it's a way of blending different models or, or you know, something like that. Figure, try to figure out where the invention lies and have, and, and then from that, start probing the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the patent and, and academic literature for prior art search. If you try to do it generically saying, yeah, we've got this new tool and we're gonna start patent searching it and you haven't, taken that step to really think about where the invention lies, it can be very easy to get lost in the search process. Right, yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve. So uh, just a follow-up question. So uh, how do you evaluate non-obviousness in, in new AI innovations? I, and the reason why I'm asking is, I think the concept of non-obviousness generates an 
incredibly complex degree of difficulty for its evaluation when we consider AI inventions. Uh, again, especially those you know aut autonomously done by by AI technology. So, who is the expert here? Like, uh, uh, you know. Uh, should it be a human being with with you know uh, a person with an ordinary skill in in the sector or or is it a trained algorithm with data uh, no i think it's a human being i think it's i think ultimately at least for the next little while i think things will change right and and, right. and there's going to be more of a I, I just don't think we're there yet another 10 20 years it'll be more of an open question in terms of if there's some autonomous being that's doing <laughs> doing the inventing. But I think for now, looking at it from a human inventor lens is, is, a, is a reasonable way to go. And I always look at it from, I like to look at the question of obviousness in terms of how I would tell the story to a patent examiner. So mm -hmm. if, if I see prior art, if I'm doing searching and I come across some prior art and I'm like, hmm, have I got something here that's non-obvious, non-obvious? Um, or do or, or, or is my invention obvious in, in view of this prior? I always I always think, well, can I create a story that I would tell to the examiner um, that would have an angle that would be persuasive? And if so, what is what is that angle in that narrative? And sometimes it is that there is, you know, these one or two pieces of prior art do tell important pieces of the story, but there's there's something missing that would prevent, like it would take this leap. Um, there's this non-obvious step in, in, in realizing that these two pieces of prior could be um, put together in a way that's going to arrive at, at the invention. So that's that's often the strategy I like to think of. So I think thinking, it, thinking of it from that perspective of the narrative that you would have, um, that tr persuasive narrative that you would want to craft. Um, mm -hmm to tell the story to an examiner is a good way to go. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, are discoveries made via computational models and algorithms patentum, mm -hmm. patentable in the EU? Um, I, that's a good question. I think, I think the EU did rule on that and they ruled that um, so I'm, I'm, I might get this wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to this is work for everybody, including me. But I think both the EU and the USPT ruled that uh, there are, you can't have a autonomous inventorship yet. There was a challenge. Yeah. There was a recent challenge to it. OK. Uh, another question. In terms of AI patenting, are there any jurisdictions outside of US or Canada that are more ahead or more behind? And how does that affect your client's decisions on where to patent or not? That's a really good question. I mean, when I think about where to patent, I always think about um, you know, questions like, where's the, where's the market? Where is this going to be used? And where's the high value market? Um, you know, where is the product going to be manufactured? That's less of an issue in terms of AI. Um, you know, there's tons of activity happening in AI in China. So uh, China has, has, has identified AI as, as a strategic focus and has invested heavily in it and has some great companies that are making great leaps and bounds there. So you could argue that even with China's um, somewhat weak yet evolving IP infrastructure, the amount of AI um, work that's happening there could, could, could make China a reasonable place to, uh, to seek patent protection. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very tricky thing to do to, to make that assessment of, of, of where to patent. Okay. Uh, something else you can do is, you know, in, in this space in particular, for example, where we are seeing strategics, filing AI-related patents, you can look at the portfolios that they are selecting and, and consider that as, as, a, as a, a place to start in, 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 in thinking about how to craft a, a reasonable uh, patent strategy for foreign patents outside of the uh, US and Canada. Right. OK. Uh, I, I do actually have one more question uh, for sure. you, Steve. Sure. Yeah, well, uh, um, yeah, it, it's a very interesting sector and uh, uh, yeah, so many challenges and issues. Uh, so my question is really uh, uh, um, a 
around AI and the disclosure aspect of patents. And I think you 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 talked uh, touched a little bit on that. But I, I think one of the you know um, major components of AI is machine learning, and you know where where there's for example, if there's an algorithm that is trained with a specific data set. So with this data, the algorithm is capable of you know, learning skills and performing tasks, uh, which could potentially be applied to new data. So, so by the nature of this you know, technology, the, the performance of the algorithm will potentially change uh, depending on the data you input. Uh, so hence, you, you know, the, the algorithm constantly changes as well. So how do you how do you patent this and and you know given the changing status of the algorithm, doesn't that pose an issue with respect to the full disclosure of the invention? Like how how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean I would argue that the that's a good question. So um, the US the US used to have a requirement to disclose the, the the best working mode of the invention, and that's no longer the case anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, as long as you can argue that, like the key, the key things, the key requirements, at least in the U.S. now, are to satisfy the requirements for enablement and, and written description. They're they're similar, but they're different. Enablement means that someone reading the patent application would be able to go there and make it work. And mm -hmm. I think you need to look at what you're claiming. So it's based on the claim. You need to, if the claim is to a specific type of model having a certain architecture, then the patent application wouldn't need to disclose any anything that shows it actually working. It would just need to disclose enough that describes the architecture of the model that would meet the requirement for written description and gives mm -hmm. someone who's got a for example, computer science degree or experience in, 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 in AI, enough that they would be able to go out, get a data set, like you would arguably need to talk about the type of data set that, that, that you know, this model should work with. And if they don't get an ideal data set, um, it's probably not a binary working, not working. It's probably more of like an AUC being 80% 70% versus 90%. From a patent perspective, that's still enablement. It still works. It just doesn't work as well. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one last question uh, from the audience. Are there any cases you know of uh, a company successfully winning a case on patent infringement in the AI and IGT space? Uh, I'm just thinking of whether reverse engineering on this technology has been well developed. That's a really good question. So I spend most of my time on the patent drafting and patent preparation side, and I don't get as much exposure to case law and litigation. So I'm going to take that one as homework. Should we do this again <laughs> next year? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's almost, uh, yeah, we're almost done. So um, we'll have to end the session. But if anyone uh, has any questions, please feel free to email them to me and I'll be happy to connect you with Steve. Uh, thank you again, Steve. It was a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thanks to our attendees for joining us this evening. Please note that our next lecture is uh, taking place on Thursday, May 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And our guest next speaker will be um, Michaela Shao, who will be uh, discussing regulation of AI in healthcare. So uh, with that, see you next week and have a very good night. Thanks, Ahmed. Thanks, everybody.